أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah, the most beneficent, the most merciful Our condolences we send to the master of our time, Imam al-Mahdi May Allah hasten his reappearance And to the jurists, Islamic nation, believers, reciters and servants of the Prince of Martyrs, Al Hussein ibn Ali, peace be upon him. My thanks to all those who strive, gave either their time or wealth in order to revive as well as partake in the sacred rites of Imam Al Hussein, peace be upon him. Whether they reside in Iraq, Iran, or any part of the world, Islamic or non-Islamic. My thanks as well to those who served in the various mosques, centers, institutions, and other non-profit organizations in order to serve the eternal message of the Prince of Martyrs, peace be upon him. Those who gave all that they had, those who faced trouble in doing so, my sincere thanks I project to them. In these ten days of Muharram, issues had arisen concerning the revival of some mourning and commemorative ceremonies. In these ten days of Muharram, issues had arisen concerning the revival of some of the mourning and commemorative ceremonies. This occurred in various cities, yet they were brought to attention and solved. Hence, I send my sincere thanks to them. I pray that Allah accepts it from them and that He, subhanahu wa ta'ala, continues to guide them and give them the capability to perform these sacred rites of Imam al-Husayn, peace be upon him, throughout the rest of the month of Muharram and the month of Safar. Furthermore, there were some who participated in the sacred rites of Imam al-Husayn, peace be upon him, who faced oppression, injury, and death. This occurred in some of the Islamic countries. One of the executives who prepares these ceremonies, these majalis, in one of these countries contacted me personally to report what had happened to them during the commemorative mourning ceremonies. I said to one of them, send my condolences and prayers and peace to the fallen martyrs and the injured. May Allah cure them. The man said to me, Some of the family members of the martyrs, when we visit them, in order to send our condolences, they would say, We wish we were graced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be counted as a martyr whilst upholding the sacred gatherings and serving our Imam. May Allah have mercy upon the fallen martyrs and raise their ranks in heaven. May Allah grant their families patience and tranquility. And may his mercy be sent upon the injured so that they may recover quickly. The respected Sayyid, now I would like to mention some reports of the holy households. Reports that mention the following. Everything that befalls upon the people from oppression and affliction is small and insignificant compared to that which has befallen the Prince of Martyrs, peace be upon him. These ahadith, these narrations and reports can be found from the sayings of the Holy Household. In the books we read reports such as that Abu Dhar, may Allah be pleased with him, who was from amongst the companions of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family, the companions who are categorized as being the ones close in proximity, al-khawas, the important and honorable ones. The traditionists have written as well that the commander of the faithful Ali, peace be upon him, and his sons al-Hasan and al Hussein, peace be upon them, all gathered in order to deliver their goodbyes. Before Abu Dhar, 
was about to leave Medina, heading towards ar rabada They were with them, consoling him, informing him to be patient upon what has befallen him from oppression and injustice by Uthman, deporting him to ar rabada and leaving him in solitude. Abu Dhar answered them by saying, What has befallen me is insignificant. I can handle it. Whereas what will befall upon you will be much more grand. Hence, I say, what will happen to you when you hear about the tragedy of Ashura, the 10th day of Muharram? Or when you hear about the full details of what happened on Ashura, the soul would then leave the body because of how grand the tragedy is. The tragedy of the Prince of Martyrs, peace be upon him. The souls will leave the body once they hear the entire tragedy of Karbala in all its details. If the entire tragedy is revealed to the believer, this will be the result. The believer wouldn't stand such sorrow, such images, and as a result, death would befall him or her. Hence, any sort of affliction that may befall someone while on this path, I say, bless. And God willing, they will be revived with the Prince of Martyrs, peace be upon him, and the martyrs of Karbala, peace be upon them. And may Allah grant their families patience and peace, God willing, and the grace and blessings of Allah. Amen. Now, I would like to narrate to you some sections from the holy sacred text of the Ziyara of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. This holy text, which was Imam al Sadiq, peace be upon him's command to Abu Hamza al Thumali, may Allah be pleased with him. In these instructions and commands, he instructed Abu Hamza to visit the Imam by reciting the Ziyara the holy sacred text of visitation. He taught him something special. And it is important to note that this incident occurred after the incident of Ashura, almost a century between the two. It is also important to note that he taught him an important existence matter, a lesson that is not subjected to Abu Hamza and not confined by a specific time period or era, meaning, it applies to us as well. Meaning, what he taught Abu Hamza Thumani can be defined to be for the common person, applying to all and not explicitly to one. This wisdom that the Imam shared with Abu Hamza is for myself and for you and for every single being on this earth. It is for humanity and not just humanity. It is for the unseen creatures, the jinn, as well as the angels, this is what you say to Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. This is the etiquette and the manners of Ziyara. We learn this from our Imam Abu Abdullah Ja'far ibn Muhammad al Sadiq, peace be upon him. What is this sentence? Well, you find it in the Ziyara, and this is what I want to speak about today and narrate to you today, and not just narrate, no. I want to make its words clear even if it's just a portion of its words. I want to make it apparent to everybody. Plus, this is not because I am obligated to do so, no. It is also because I do not want to be considered amongst the muqassireen, those who neglect the rights of the Imam, the rights of the Prince of Martyrs, peace be upon him. Because everything that exists would not be existent if it was not for Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. Everything that is placed in front of Abi Abdullah al Hussein is insignificant. Now, 
as for the sentence from the sacred text which was taught by Imam al-Sadiq, peace be upon him, to Abu Hamza, this sacred text which outlines the etiquette and manners of the ziyarah, let us read it now. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim min kana lam yajibka badani anda istighathatik wa lisani anda istinsarik faqad ajabaka qalbi wa sam'i wa basari if my body did not respond to your plea and my tongue did not respond to your call, then surely now, O Abu Abdullah, my heart, my ears, and my sight are at your service. The Imam, peace be upon him, in this section of the sacred text, points towards two heart-rending, horrific, grand tragedies. You, you, O visitor of Imam al Hussein. When you read this sentence, you testify and speak, promising the Imam, peace be upon him. And it is obligatory upon you to make this promise. Because you say, my heart, ears, and sight respond to you now. The Imam, peace be upon him, in this section of the sacred text, points towards two heart-rending, horrific, grand tragedies. You, you, O visitor of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, when you read this sentence, you testify and speak, promising the Imam, and it is obligatory upon you to make this promise, because you say, my heart, ears, and sight respond to you now they are at your service I do not want to read the tragedy of Ashura here but I want to dive deep into the tragedy of what's happened to the Prince of Martyrs to widen our understanding and get more answers this statement if my body did not respond to your plea and my tongue did not respond to your call, you will not find it for any other infallible that they plead or called for aid. None of them uttered such a statement during their last moments living, even though they were all martyrs. This statement, if my body did not respond to your plea and my tongue did not respond to your call, you will not find it for any of the infallibles that they plead or called for aid. None of them uttered such statements during their last moments living, even though they were all martyred. As our Imams, peace be upon them, have said, there is not one of us except that he is either killed or poisoned. I want to make something of the Imam's words clear. The part wherein the Imam asks for aid and pleads. I say make something or part of it clear because it is impossible to bring its full essence, the full wisdom behind it and its secrets. Also, I don't want to defy the honor of the Prince of Martyrs by speaking on his behalf, hence why I say I shall try to make part of it clear. Our Imam, peace be upon him, said, We are the princes of speech. Meaning that they are, peace be upon them, the most eloquent in speech and linguistics. In their words, there are mysteries and secrets that none can grasp and hold on to. We say now that when one pleads, he or she does so when he or she is placed with affliction. We would like to say now that when somebody pleads, asks for aid, he or she does so when they are faced with affliction, pressure, and they are in a very serious situation. 
When the individual cannot move right or left, he finds all paths blocked. This is usually when one would plea and ask for aid, ask for help. Meaning that Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, in this sentence is trying to uncover for us and show us the state in which Imam Al Hussein, peace be upon him, was in on that day in Karbala on Ashura. The Imam called out to all the Shia, not just the Shia at the time, but a call that breaks the barrier of time and space, a call for every era, for every time, for every century. Because we did make mention of this, that this sentence found in the sacred text is not for a specific person or specific time period, no. In fact, it is for every period and every era and every time. It is incumbent upon the scholars, jurists, speakers, reciters and researchers to pay close attention to the words of the Imam. Ponder upon them, read between the lines, understand the sections wherein the Imam makes mention of the plea, the call for help and the response. As for the response, meaning, when the Imam, peace be upon him, called out for aid in the loudest of his voices, as per some of the reports, it states that everyone heard the call of the Imam, so that the proof be laid upon those who heard the call and did not respond to it. So no one has an excuse to utter later on, which is why he said, Is there not a companion, a friend? Someone to aid us. There is no difference if the Imam utters this call with, the, with his family and companions around or not around. The essence is one. The call is one. Since his heart is attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his soul is attached as well. He seeks Allah as his final destination. There is no question about it that these tragedies are heavy on his shoulders and his pure heart. But the question here is why did the Imam utter this plea, this call? That is a question I have no answer for and even he who was bigger than me cannot answer nor comprehend it. It is a secret that lies with the Imam, lies with Allah. Since we know that the Prince of Martyrs, peace be upon him, knew that in the coming moments he will depart towards his Lord. Hence the question is asked, why did he plea? Why did he make the call? The Imam himself knows the answer to this question. When the call was uttered, when was the call uttered? We can grasp the answer from some of the reports, such as some would state that this call from the Imam, peace be upon him, was uttered when he was alone on the plains, after the martyrdom of his companions and members of his holy household. No one was with him except Imam al-Sajjad, peace be upon him, and during that time he was sick, and the reports inform us that his body was so fragile that he could barely raise his hands or depend on them because of the intensity of his sickness. The Imam knew that he will be killed and this was made apparent to him during the, that time period. In fact, in the universe before this one, the universe of photons and particles, the Imam had knowledge of this. Well, we can say that he had knowledge of this even before that universe, the universe of creation, meaning the universe in which Allah first began all creation since the Imam was there, the first from amongst Allah's creations and during that time and in that period Allah had informed him of the day of Karbala, meaning he knew.
The Imam is a human. In this universe, meaning, he carries emotion and feeling. He has sense, he has a heart, a generous and merciful one. Like every parent, but his heart is even more generous and more merciful and kind than all the other hearts. Since he is the merciful father, the father of all. But the Imam's stronghold of knowledge and his infallibility and his strength in holding on to Allah and accepting all that may come from him, he is able to overcome the most horrific and intense tragedies. Because as we see, every single one of these tragedies that befall upon his heart were so grand. If it was you or me or anyone else that was subjected to these tragedies, not the tragedy as a whole, but a small percentage of it, how heavy would it be on our shoulders? Would our hearts be able to withstand it? When we look at the Imam, peace be upon him, we see that the tragedies continue and constantly befall upon him, always subjected to them. But his strong mind, vision, divine authority and infallibility would protect him from these tragedies so that they won't beat him. Also, it was not decreed for the Imam, peace be upon him, that he uses a miracle, a sign from Allah, in order to reflect all these tragedies. Hence, these tragedies would indeed hurt his pure heart more than what he would face from tragedies. As for the martyrs who died in the battlefield, they were companions whom were very precious to the Imam, to the point where one would be more precious than the other. Since even in the companions of the Imam, there are levels. I will narrate to you an example here, a parable, a common one so that all can understand the pain and sorrow that the Imam, peace be upon him, was in. Take this for example, take this hypothetical situation. If a man is to enter his house and his young daughter greets him upon his entry, his daughter looks, he looks at his daughter shaking in fear. The father immediately says, oh daughter, why is it that you're in such a state? The daughter responds saying, some policemen came, O oh father, and they want to take you away. What goes through the father's mind when he sees this image, this image of his daughter in such a fearful state, a state of fear, weeping, sadness? What happens to the father? What happens to his heart? It is well known from the historical reports that there were approximately 80 children, boys and girls and women in Karbala. They were all with Abu Abdullah al Hussein, peace be upon him. Furthermore, not all of them were like Lady Zainab, peace be upon her, possessing a patient heart. Plus, not all of them are at the same level in terms of what they can withstand from pain and affliction. Plus, even though Lady Zainab possesses this honorable state, possesses knowledge, cognizance, and patience, and so on and so forth, we still read in the reports that the Imam, peace be upon him, placed his hand on her heart in order to calm her pure heart from the tragedies. He made her stronger in the face of the tragedies, and with this her patience increased. What about Lady Rabah, peace be upon her? She did not possess the level that Zainab had in terms of patience and such. Same with Lady Sakina and Lady Ruqayya and all the other pure ladies in Karbala. I ask, I say, what befell them? What befell their pure hearts from fear, sorrow and grief? 
that would also befall the prince of martyrs as he knows what is going to occur to them after his martyrdom. He sees them gathered around him, crying and shaking. They see everyone on the plains, from their own family members and from the companions, all lying on the field of battle, dead. They see this image materialize in front of them, image of fallen, slaughtered martyrs. On top of all this, they see the Imam, peace be upon him, a stranger, alone, preparing himself for death while he, peace be upon him, sees them in a state of fear. By Allah, what was going through his mind at the time? Is he not a human? Does his heart not feel pain? What is he to do? How does he calm them, bring peace to their hearts when they are of different ages and each possesses different levels of patience, each and every single one of them are in a state of fear, hunger, and thirst. The Imam, peace be upon him, sees all of this, and during that period of time, that moment in time, he uttered this call, this plea. And from this angle, we see why Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, had instructed us to say, Then surely now my heart, ears, and sight are at your service, O Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Let us be truthful when we utter these words to our Imam. And of course, everyone is different in terms of how blessed he or she is in following through with these words. We ask Allah that we can surely act upon these words. O oh, Aba Abdullah, if my body did not respond to your plea on that day in Karbala, on that day, I was not there by your side to fight by your side and die by your side. I answer the call today. I really want to make this apparent again. It is impossible to fully comprehend the meaning of the Imam's plea on that day in Karbala since there is a deep understanding that we will never grasp. I cannot do it, nor do I possess the means to do so. O oh, Hussein. If my body did not respond to your plea on that day in Karbala. O oh, Aba Abdullah, you did not ask for your grandfather, the Prophet of Islam, Muhammad. Nor did you ask for, the fa for your father, the commander of the faithful. Nor did you ask for your mother, Fatima. Nor did you ask for your brother, Hassan, peace be upon them all. Nor did you ask for your infallible sons. I did not find in the words of Imam al-Hujjah our awaited Savior anywhere wherein he pleads and asks for aid. O oh, Aba Abdullah, my body was not there in Karbala. If it was, I would have answered you. And how I wish that I was there in Karbala on that day when you said, Is there not anyone to aid us, help us? I was not there, O oh Abu Abdullah, but now, my master, my heart, ears, and sight have answered your call. This sacred sentence, when you utter it and read it in the holy sacred text of the ziyara, when you say, my heart, ears, and sight have answered your call, it means that your heart, ears, and sight has answered the imam. Which brings us to this question, what is your obligation now? Our Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him, if we pay close attention to his instructions, he uses the term body for the term plea and uses the term tongue for the term call for aid. These are things we should pay close attention to in the words of the Imam as they may uncover for us some sequence. Hence I say, O oh scholars, O oh speakers, research into this. Why were these terms used? Why was the body a replacement for the plea when the Imam could have used any other word such as my soul or my sword or myself? The Imam was martyred in the year 61 after Hijrah in that horrific way slaughtered in Karbala. Since that day, 
till today there has not been a day of Ashura that has passed by except that a problem arises. Since the time of the accursed Yazid ibn Muawiyah and even after him, such as during the time of Bani Umayyah, the reign of Marwan and his progeny, and after that the reign of Banu Abbas, then the reign of the Umayyads and so on and so forth, till today's era. For over 50 years I witnessed with my own eyes problems tend to arise on the day of Ashura in Iraq. And today you witness explosions and terrorism all over Iraq. And today you witness explosions and terrorism all over Iraq in the commemorative gatherings of mourning and lamentation over the Prince of Martyrs. Oppression dealt upon those who uphold the sacred rights of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. Furthermore, the person who bombs himself doesn't even know the people he has killed, nor does he know him personally in order to take his anger out on him or her. Their problem lies with the Prince of Martyrs, Abi Abdullah, since these people believe. Their problem lies with the Prince of Martyrs, Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, since these believers follow Islam, follow the Apostle of Allah, they follow the household, that is their crime. In the olden days, as well as till today, they deny some believers from performing these sacred rites and commemorative gatherings of mourning and lamentation, while before, in some places, in some locations, they would be allowed. For example, in the period of Shah Rida Shah, the ruler of Iran at the time, in his last five years of his rule, he would increase his pressure upon those who perform these sacred rites. I was never there during that time period, but I was blessed in meeting some who lived during those times. From the grand scholars and jurists, those who witnessed these eras and lived them, these scholars informed us of these tough times that the Shia lived in. Some of you also witnessed these times or lived during the times of Rida Shah the way he forbade the believers from performing the sacred rites of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him in the last years of his life. He did not leave a ritual except that he forbade it during that time. It is narrated that even in the private gatherings he would forbid. And if he would be informed of a gathering taking place anywhere in private, he would take the mourners to prison, torture them and show them the harshest of conditions. On top of all these harsh conditions and in these hard conditions that befall the believers, the grand jurist, the shaykh, al-mirza al-na'ini, may Allah bless his soul, issued his famous well-known legal pronouncement declaration fatwa concerning the sacred rights of Imam al-Hussein peace be upon him he divided his, his legal declaration of the sacred rights of Abi Abdullah al-Hussein into four categories and in each category he explicitly defined each and every right of Imam al-Hussein peace be upon him his end conclusion or Result in this legal declaration was istihbab, meaning he concluded that all that falls under the rites, the rituals of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, is recommended. He also said that if an individual performed one of the rites of Imam al Hussein and upon doing so, the designee, the individual performing these rites, dies in the process, as Shaykh al Na'ini says, nothing befalls him. He has committed no unlawful act, no sin, and in fact the designee, the mukallaf, would be considered one with reward, abundance of reward. Several, ten, no, more than ten jurists have authorized and signed this declaration of Shaykh al-Na'ini, this fatwa of a Shaykh al-Na'ini, agreeing and testifying to his conclusion without question. Several of them commented on this fatwa, this declaration of a shaykh with praise. I have seen almost 100 jurists comment on this declaration 
in agreement and testimony with what has come from an naini Furthermore, we have not seen nor we have heard that anyone has died in performing any of these sacred rites of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, on the morning of the 10th day of Muharram. Whereas you see people dying during the Hajj pilgrimage or in the shrine of the Imam or during the sacred ziyarah, yet these are not issues that prevent us from not performing these duties, nor are they a reason for us to look back away from the sacred rights of Imam Hussein, peace be upon him. Several grand jurists, grand scholars have aided Al Naini in his declaration. Several of his students and even those students who were never blessed with his presence, who never attended his classes once, such as a Sayyid Abdul Hadi al Shirazi, may Allah have mercy on his soul, who aided Al Naini in his declaration concerning the Husseini rights. Then we look at all the others that came after Al Naini, who also aided and testified to the declaration of the Shaykh, the grand jurists, the grand scholars whom are well known. Some of them upon commenting on Naini's declaration said, this declaration, this fatwa from a Shaykh Al-Mirza and naini is correct and contains no error whatsoever. Meaning, everything found in the declaration, all its details, it's correct with no error is what the scholars would say. They would say everything in it is in accordance with the evidence found in the sacred laws, the Sharia. It is important to make note of this again, that this occurred during the time period where the Shah forbade the sacred rituals of the Imam in Iran. Also, we see during this time period, the city that neighbors Iran, which is Al-Basra city, which is considered the largest, second largest city in Iraq. In the city, you would find the believers upholding the symbols of Allah by reviving the mourning and lamentation gatherings over the martyred Imam. It is reported that during that time, the majalis, the commemorative gatherings, would reach 2,000 in the city of Basra alone, not counting the nearby districts and small towns. All of these believers perform these gatherings in order to support an naini during the rough times in which the Husseini rights were being forbade and attacked. His declaration reached many and affected many even though it came through in a very difficult time. But the scholars during that period all stood by his side and aided him in this matter until after his passing, his students, and until today we have scholars that refer to this historical and famous declaration. I, as well, was blessed by Allah to sign this declaration about 10 years ago when my older brother, a Sayyid Muhammad al-Shirazi, may Allah purify and bless his soul, passed away. Imam al-Hussein, peace be upon him, was killed so that he will remain till today. Imam al-Hussein, peace be upon him, was killed so that he would remain till today. So that Islam may continue to live and Islam is eternal because of Hussein. I say this now to the individual who stands tall and strong in front of the sacred rituals and rites of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, wanting to end it, that either he has no religion or no intellect or neither. Because every individual who has attacked and showed enmity and waged war towards these sacred rites has departed towards the eternal fires of hell. Just like Rada Shah al Bahlawi, since these sacred rites continue and Hussein, peace be upon him as well, continues to exist eternally and forever. Shah Rada Bahlawi departed towards the hellfire. His cohorts, those that are like him, also departed towards the eternal fires of hell. Yasin al Hashimi, Ata Turk, Abdul Karim Qasim, and several others which I have seen myself. And after all of them, the accursed Saddam and his Ba'ath party, they killed and forbade the believers from upholding the sacred rites. But they ran away from the oppressors ran away from Saddam, the believers, 
and from parables like they killed and forbade the believers from upholding the sacred rites. The believers ran away from the oppressors, ran away from Saddam and from parables like him. They ran towards Iran and they were able to uphold these sacred rites in a more better fashion. We used to say before that so many gatherings would take place all over the world. And today I say to you, millions of gatherings take place in honoring the sacred rites and symbols and rituals of Abi Abdullah al There are more than 200 countries on this green earth. And there is not a country except that there is a commemorative gathering honoring the sacred rites of Abi Abdullah al -Husayn. Every time a group is pressured, this group travels elsewhere to uphold these gatherings. And Allah, glorified be He, says in the Qur'an, Are not the lines of Allah not large enough for you, for you to migrate across it? So many migrated. Many traveled in these last 50 years from their own Islamic countries because of pressure upon them and went to the Western countries. But... They were graced by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and given the capability to perform these sacred rites of Abi Abdullah. And now we see one thousand, tens of thousands and more gatherings commemorating Abi Abdullah's martyrdom in these countries. Because my dear guests, my dear believers, because this matter of Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, is like the rain droplets. Wherever the droplet finds space, it would fall. And Hussein is like that. His message, his matter, wherever space is found on God's green earth, a flag of Hussein will be raised. Where is the Shah now? Where is Abdul Karim Qasim who ruled for five years? In four of the five years, he gave the believers freedom to perform. Yet in his last year, he forbade them from doing so. He opposed and hurt, tortured and imprisoned. Yet we find in this last year of his, he departed towards the fires of hell. Yazid said to Our Lady Zainab, peace be upon her, do you see how Allah dealt with your brother Hussein? By uttering this, Yazid wanted to show his greatness and be proud for what he had accomplished. This is the slogan and chant of the followers of Yazid in every era, every period of time, thinking they have a stronghold over Al Hussein, peace be upon him and over his sacred rites and rituals. Yet how did Lady Zainab respond? How did Lady Zainab shake the very foundation of Yazid? What was her response? She responded with the Qur'an saying, And let not those who disbelieve ever think that because we extend their time of enjoyment, it is better for them. We only extend it for them so that they may increase in sin. And for them is an everlasting, humiliating punishment. The individual who continues to wage war against the sacred, honorable rights of Imam al-Hussein, peace be upon him, will be filled with sin for that period of time. As the Qur'an says, it extends only that they may increase in sin. Look at al-Mutawakkil who ruled for about 20 years. Attacking and waging war against the sacred Husseini rights. He did it in such a way that was not seen before in history. But where is Al Mutawakkil today? Where is the grave in which he was buried in, in Samarra? Ask those who believe and follow Al Mutawakkil, those who count him from amongst the patrons of Allah. A commander appointed by Allah, those who take from him legal declarations and law. Or look at Ibn Arabi and those who follow Ibn Arabi. I ask again, where is the grave of Al Mutawakkil? Where is the grave of Yazid? Where is the grave of Harun? Nothing of Harun's grave is remembered except the curses and damnation that befalls upon him. 
He is buried behind Imam al radah when the believers would circulate the grave of the Imam and they arrive behind the Imam. Upon arrival, they would begin cursing and invoking Allah to send his damnation upon Harun al-Abbasi. This is what is remembered of Harun. Curses and humiliation is what is left in his remembrance and their remembrance. Again, we say, if my body did not respond to your plea, then today my heart, ears, and sight have answered your call, my Master Hussein. What are we to do now? What are our obligations towards the Imam? Now that we have uttered this response and answered this call, We should strive in serving Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, in every way possible. Every sacred rite should be delivered in the best of fashions. We should perform every sacred rite, even if it's one of them. Even if we can't, we should continue to strive to do so. Because if we don't try and don't serve, we are not performing our due rites and answering the call of the Imam. For example, we should prepare a commemorative gathering in his remembrance even if there are no attendees. One must prepare these gatherings because they revive the hearts. Furthermore, if the individual is able to perform more than this, then he or she should do so. If the individual cannot prepare a religious gathering, he or she should at least attend another one ongoing or he or she should bring friends and family, inform them of these gatherings, tell them to attend, for in it is grand reward. Furthermore, the individual who does not do anything while possessing the capability to do so has lost in this world and the hereafter. Because you have answered al Hussein, peace be upon him, by saying, My sight, ears, and heart have answered you, O Hussein. How can your heart and ears and sight answer him without action, without performance? Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him, is a proof upon us, a hujjah, since his message is universal and continues to break the barrier of time and space. Being a proof upon the creation means his message must be delivered to all beings. Hence, it is incumbent upon us to spread this message as well. Deliver it, make Al Hussein apparent and known to all of Allah's creations, all corners of the world. Of course, everyone in their own given capability. One of the ways that we can deliver the universal message of Imam Al Hussein, which is considered to be one of the most important mediums, and that is the satellite channels. This may be the greatest medium, the greatest means that we possess. The satellite channels and media can deliver this sacred universal message to the entire world. The tragedy and message of Karbala, everything that is attached to Imam al Hussein, all categories, jurisprudence, manners, ethics, morality, and so on and so forth of Hussein can be delivered through this medium. With this medium, we can show to the world the following. Why did Imam al Hussein not pledge allegiance to Yazid and his cohorts? Why did he not surrender? Why did he take his family with him? Why did he take his children with him? All of these questions can be discussed and be made apparent to the world through this medium. And when this message is delivered, the Imam will be the proof upon this earth since this message will be made clear to all, to everyone. No one will then come forth with an excuse saying, I did not hear, I do not know. We possess these prerequisites, which means it is incumbent upon us to perform this obligation. All ages, young and old, of course, the young are more capable of doing this. They are more active and possess a higher degree of capability, as stated in the prophetic sayings. Now, 
today. We have over 12,000 satellites. All of them are different in terms of their message. Now, we have over 12,000 satellites. All of them are different in terms of their message. One may be for business, another for a specific ideology or belief. We, the Shia, are a large number of this world's population, which means we have an obligation in this matter that we must not be left silent. Why can't we learn from the disbelievers the way they deliver their message with such passion? Why can't we use these tools and instruments? Why can't we use these tools and instruments that we possess in order to deliver the eternal message of Hussein, peace be upon him? We should advance. We should learn and take advantage of what's available between our hands today. How do others deliver and propagate this message? How do others fundraise money? They delivered their corrupt beliefs and messages, their ideologies and politics. Why can't we take advantage and use these for our own message? The universal message of justice, the message of Abi Abdullah, Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him. Today, the majority of countries have freedom. And working in this matter is simple. The matter of buying satellite channels is like buying apples from the market. It is made simple if one strives to work, if one has the ambition to do change. The process requires two things, wealth and a group of people to strive in this matter, in organization and administration. As for wealth, the Shia possess billions or at least no others that have such wealth. Those who want to make benefit of this wealth, he or she will be rewarded. But I say this, even those that have no wealth, they can contribute to this cause. Let me share with you this story. Last year, a group of believers from one of the Islamic countries were poor and did not possess wealth. But they had a mission. They all gathered and took donations until they were able to open a satellite channel. And today they are spreading tashayyu' Shi'ism with the satellite channel in a very beautiful fashion. Furthermore, they informed me as well that the country gives one-fourth of their income in order to support such non-profit programs. Meaning, they are able to take this money in order to pay off their loans in order that they would pay no interest. This is what these young men did. They gathered together with one plan in mind, one mission. They took loans and they funded this satellite channel. The majority of today's countries give such loans to people who have such projects and have such ideas. I say, let us benefit and learn from the Holy Prophet and the commander of the faithful, and from Amal Hassan, peace be upon them all, and from our great scholars, they all used to take loans in order to deliver an important message. Do you not take loans for weddings? Do you not take loans in order to buy appliances and furniture for your homes? This means you can do the same by taking loans and serving the Islamic message, funding these satellite channels. Let there be a small group of 20 or 10, let them work together in order to serve this cause. Take loans and create these satellite channels in order to deliver the eternal message of Imam al-Hussein, peace be upon him. I ask the youth now, the young Shia youth from the last Ashura until this year's Ashura, what have you done for Imam al-Hussein, peace be upon him? so that his message continues to live eternally and forever. From today I say, from the day of Ashura until the upcoming Ashura, we need to partner in this cause. From today I say, hear me now, from the day of Ashura this year until the upcoming Ashura, 
we need to participate in this cause in opening up a satellite channel or opening up satellite channels so that they reach 1200 the second matter that is needed proper organization and administration and this is an important aspect of creating a satellite channel as for the Shia in Iraq Iran Lebanon Syria Kuwait and the others they live in an Islamic environment the Shia possess large numbers of thinkers intellectuals and administrators take advantage of these great minds in order to serve Imam al Hussein, peace be upon him in the Islamic countries as well as in the non-Islamic countries we have Islamic universities or at least they have Shia in them who teach in these universities and colleges the Shia are many around the world. They are not small in number. The intellectual Shia reach the millions and more than that as well. We should take advantage of these individuals in order to build proper organization and administration of these satellite channels. If we look back in time, we didn't possess such minds back then. Yet today we have the capability, we possess these means. We should take hold of this great advantage before we lose it from between our hands. I say this and I repeat, why? I say this again and I repeat myself, you must have by the next Ashura 1200 satellite channels. Some may ask, why 1200? Our question, some may ask, why 1200? Our answer to this question is this, simple. In some countries you find 10,000 or more doctors. Why are there 10,000? Doesn't each and every single one of them have his own profession or his own specialization, his medium, his medium of sustenance? Does anyone question these numbers or is it something normal? It is sad to state, but the Shia Marja'iyya, the sacred institution, is not as strong as it used to be. My father, who was one of the students of Sayyid Muhammad Kadhim al Yazdi, narrates that when the Sayyid passed away, and mind you, the Sayyid raised hundreds of students in Iran and Iraq and elsewhere. When the Sayyid passed away, 90 jurists presented their book on Islamic law presenting themselves as jurists, as maraja. Today, when a marja dies, how many present their degree in Islamic jurisprudence as a marja? How many possess the conditions of marja'iyya in this claimant? It is as if this matter has become simple and easygoing without conditions and prerequisites. And it might stay like this until it falls in the hands of Imam al-Mahdi. May Allah hasten his, appear his reappearance. He will solve and cure all of these diseases that we have today in this era. It is also important to state that those who pay close attention to the Shia books from the past 1000 years will discover no serious advancement, no more than 10% or less. In the last 50 years in Iran, in the various cities and towns, lied several scholars who possess the appropriate qualifications and prerequisites for juristship. This is what we read in the autobiographies of these scholars. Read and you shall discover. One of the scholars who was older than me has narrated to me the following. About 20 years ago or more, a group came from one of the far districts of Iran that falls in one of the cities that are not known to be of the large cities. They came asking for speakers to deliver the message of Islam. The scholar responded saying, 20 years ago, 40 scholars possessing the appropriate qualifications of marja'iyya resided in your district. How do you want me? to send you a speaker when you possess such jurists with such pristine qualifications, scholars that surely possess students who can deliver the message. 
what is the reason behind me reporting the story for you? Well, the question is, where is the marja'iya today? Where is the sacred institution of jurisprudence? Well, the question is, where is the marja'iya today? Where is the sacred institution? Since the Abbasid period until our period today, there has been someone. Since the Abbasid period until our period today, has there been someone that has flourished like a Sayyid al Radi? Or like his brother, Al-Murtada Alam Al-Huda, or like Sheikh Al-Tusi, or like the other grand jurist of our sacred school? Most of what they wrote back then can be found in our books today, from doctrine, theology, and jurisprudence. And in this time period, we only see 1% difference maybe in the books of the jurists today. We have not advanced, we have not changed our methodology of writing. And if we have changed, the number is minute. It's 1%, maybe less or more. But I send my thanks to God. There are grand jurists and scholars that we can benefit from in these programs. In building these satellite channels and spreading them in order to propagate the message of Islam to the entire world. When Imam al Hussein wanted to leave Medina towards Karbala, he wrote in his will, I want to enjoin good and forbid wrong and follow in the path of my grandfather, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him and his family, and my father, the Commander of the Faithful, peace be upon him. What message did Imam al Hussein make apparent to the world? This message which he was martyred for, it is important that this message reaches all of humanity. Hence, it is important to take loans in order to deliver this message. Take from the wealthy businessmen who have been graced and blessed by Allah with the wealth that they possess. How did the Prophet and the Commander of the Faithful live their lives? We should analyze the very details of their lives in order to benefit from them and learn from them. The Imam was martyred in reviving and enacting the message of his grandfather and his father. This message should be made apparent to all. Also, it is important to narrate that our awaited Savior, Imam Al Mahdi Al Muntadar, may Allah hasten his reappearance, will follow in the path of his grandfather, Al Hussein ibn Ali. Hence, we see how important the eternal message of Hussein is. Everything that humanity possesses from perfection stems from the holy household of Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Everything that lies in their lives is perfection, and you won't find that anyone from this pure household ever killed. Everything that lies in their lives is perfection, and you won't find that anyone from this pure household who killed in delivering their message. Yes, in the case of Muawiyah, al mamun and so on, you will find worldly gains, individuals who seek political power and who killed for power. Even the enemies who have written about the lives of the Prophet and the commander of the faithful Ali, peace be upon them, they have not written in their books that they had a single individual imprisoned for any political need or gain. Read their books and discover the truth. Can anyone today claim that they don't have people in prison because of their political agenda? The same people who speak for freedom, can they propose such a claim? Hence, this is why the Muslims should make apparent to all of humanity how the Prophet, the commander of the faithful, Peace be upon them, treated the communities they were in. And this should be done by funding satellite channels, by founding satellite channels and creating these channels. Each mosque should have a satellite channel. In every name of every infallible, the eternal message of Hussein should continue in this matter. Is there a satellite today in the name of Al Sayyidah, Lady Zainab, peace be upon her? A channel all about her, a channel that shows her characteristics, traits, ethics, teachings and biography. This is what we need to do today in order that everyone and all 
had knowledge of this great hero of Karbala. O oh, Shia youth, you who say my ears, sight and heart have answered you, should not only stand and mourn, stand and lament, but on top of mourning and lamenting, we should create these satellite channels in the name of Our Lady Zainab. In the name of Shaykh Al-Mufid and those like him, the rare individuals whom have flourished in history. I have read books of various other religions and have not found anyone like Shaykh Al-Mufid or Shaykh Al-Tusi. Why is it? Why is it that someone like Muslim ibn Aqil, the first martyr in the Husseini pathway, the Husseini message, the man whom you request from desires and wants and needs, why is there no satellite channel in his name? We need more channels. Channels carrying the name of Salman al Muhammadi, Al Hudayfat ibn al Yaman, or Zurara, or on the names of the various scholars and jurists. From the likes of a Sayyid Bahr al Uloom. And I say there is no equivalent in history or humanity like that of a Sayyid Bahr al Uloom. May Allah be pleased with him. About 200 years ago, the Jews possessed a university, a Jewish university, in the city of Al Kifr in Iraq. They possessed over 3,000 students, and none was able to move these people during that time except one. A Sayyid Bahr al Ulum. He went to them, sat amongst them, spoke to them for three hours, discussing with them until the greatest rabbis and the best students from amongst the school became Shia. They all became Shia. Which is why we must create a channel in the name of Sayyid Bahr al Ulum to inform the world that. To inform the world of this character and his works and contributions by the grace of Allah. Which is why which is why we must create a channel on the name of a Sayyid Bahr al Ulum. To inform the world of this character and of his works and contributions. This discussion that took place between the Sayyid and the Jews has been transcribed and printed and can be read today. We must make the world aware that we have such people that have contributed so much to religion. Or the likes of Al-Mirza Al-Shirazi who saved Iran from the British colony. And if he didn't do they would still be residing there today. Does he not deserve to have a channel in his name? Or the likes of Muhammad Taqi al-Shirazi who also contributed to this religion. Or others like him such as Al-Wahid al-Bahbahani or Hussein Kashif al-Ghita and so on and so forth from the grand jurists and scholars. O Shia youth, may you be blessed to perform these duties by Allah so the world has knowledge of such flourishing enlightening individuals. Let us benefit from our scholars and honor them, respect them and learn the wisdom that they possess. From today until the next Ashura that will come, we should have a grand number of satellite channels so that we can propagate this message. Before the enemies take advantage and beat us in this matter, we must rise to this matter and not let it be idle. All in the name of Hussein, peace be upon him. That is all that we have for you today. We ask Allah to grant us these blessed opportunities in serving the Prince of Martyrs, performing the sacred honorable rites and rituals, creating satellite channels, institutions, centers, and so on and so forth. May Allah grant the requests and desires of all the believers. Bless them and grace them with his divine mercy and sustenance by the right of the awaited Savior, Al-Mahdi wal-Muntadar. May Allah hasten his reappearance. Amen.